Hello, everybody. Welcome to the SoxProspects.com podcast. We're the web's number one source for information on the Boston Red Sox farm system from top to bottom, from Fort Myers to Pawtucket, and all stops in between. Thank you for the listen. My name is Chris Hatfield. I'm the executive editor of Sox Prospects. I am joined, as always, as we are serenaded by the dulcet tones of the Ludlow Thieves by our director of scouting, Ian Cundell. Ian, uh, draft week is done. It's June. We've got new rankings. We've got a lot to talk about. Yeah, it's an exciting time of the year, and it's actually finally the weather's like kind of nice now. It's <laughs> it's remarkable how much better things are when it's warm outside and not raining. It, it could always move. It could always move down here. Um, yeah. Well, we're not going to make it the Sox Prospects Weather Report podcast, but we want to thank you all for listening. Uh, we also want to give a shout out to our five dollar level supporters on Patreon dot com slash Sox Prospects. That'd be Sox Signatures, Kirby Miller, Kyle Costigan, Tyler Woodrall, Jeff Trainer, David Nardone, Tim Harding, Bill Stanton, Deb Kendall, Evan Kirkwood, Hurricanes 1, Chris Fox, James O'Hara, Nathan Kenyon, Andrew Wallen, Lendl Martin, Pat from New NH, Ben Burnett, David B., and our newest $5 level supporter um, who put their name in as Cy. Um, however, however, if you're doing the $5 level, I'm going to read your name as long as it's not inappropriate as you put it in under the name. Uh, field. So if you want me to read something else, as Pat from NH has learned by changing his name a couple times, um, yeah, make sure you just put it in that way. But um, thank you to Cy. Um, it, it, as we'd like to mention, the Patreon.com game updates um, should be starting back up soon-ish, Ian, once your car gets fixed. Yeah, um, probably next weekend because Lowell opens next Friday, so... It's is the it 14th. That soon? It that's I just realized I just posted it. I just realized that the date we have on the page is wrong. It's the okay. 14th. That makes sense. That makes a lot yeah. more sense because they sent um a lot of the uh players who were in extended up to Lowell. Yeah. So, we, so they we're start starting to get that. some idea on some of the guys who are there. But we're going to wait to talk about the roster until we have a better uh, yeah. fuller knowledge of of who is on that roster. But yeah, they should start back up next weekend. They should. They should. So we'll be we'll be back at that soon. Um, so that'll be good. Uh, one more thing to talk about, uh, but it's also the SoxProspects.com donation drive. Um, once a year, we ask you uh, to help support what we do here at Sox Prospects. Um, we're asking for your help to raise seven thousand dollars to keep Sox Prospects up and running for another year. Uh, your donations help cover site costs in two primary areas. That's firsthand coverage, uh, travel costs for scouting and player columns. I know we've been a little slow lately, but I mean, like in July alone, I'm heading to Aberdeen, to Frederick, to Bowie. Potentially, might even go up to Camden um, to see the Red Sox major leaguers and how they look. But, uh, yeah, I've got a busy month coming up. Ian's going to start catching some uh, some Lowell games, some maybe some Portland. Um, so it helps cover that. Also helps cover general IT costs, hardware, software, Internet costs, hosting fees, things of that nature. Um, we anticipate our costs this year to exceed $16,000. So we, we cover about half of that from online advertising. But your donations help us ensure that we can cover those costs. And you can help support us two ways. One, you could go to the Patreon Again, that's patreon.com slash Sox Prospects and give an amount um, per episode. So the $5 level supporters that I, whose names I read every episode are supporting at $5 per episode. If you do $2 per episode, you get access to the game updates. You could do $1 per episode. You could do some other random number. Whatever it is, we appreciate uh, our, the support of our patrons. You can also go, as I learned last year, to SoxProspects.com slash donate. Uh, and you do not need the .htm, as Mike informed me, like midway through the donations drive last year. But SoxProspects.com/slash/donate if you'd rather do maybe a one-time donation. Um, again, just as appreciated. Yeah. So, uh, but anyways, we appreciate everyone who has supported us. If you've thought about supporting us, any amount helps. Whatever you feel comfortable doing, we'll appreciate your support. So again, SoxProspects.com/slash/donate or patreon.com slash Sox Prospects. And then finally, send your emails to podcast at SoxProspects.com. We want to talk about what you want to hear about, guys. We've got a draft recap today. We've got new rankings to talk about, but we've also got some listener emails. We're going to hit those up. And if you want to get your questions in, if you want to get your thoughts here for us to to opine on, uh, send your email in to podcast uh, at SoxProspects.com. Ian Son, should we get into this? We've got some uh, quick news that we'll hit on. Not not a whole lot going on since our last podcast. We, of course, had the day one draft uh, reaction 
pod that we already hit. Uh, that came out on Monday. You can find it in the feed. If you're listening to this, go to the last episode. That's what that is. But um, really, Ian, the one I wanted to mention, really there's two transactions that are recent that stand out to me. One, I mean, we, we I should say because we mentioned the Jaron Duran promotion on the last episode. That's we obviously did. a big deal. Um, we have on June the 7th, two days ago, we're recording this on, on uh, Sunday the 9th. On Friday, Brian Mata got activated from the DL. Uh, five strong innings in Salem after a month off. Um, Yawn. He did – what's that? Yawn. Five more good innings from Brian Mata. What a surprise. Yeah, I mean he's been good this year. Um, yeah. But really, I mean we'll talk a little bit more about him in the rankings maybe. So maybe let's save the discussion of this for the rankings because it, See, the, the month off affected how I – Correct. Him. Special. Well, it was. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We'll get there. We'll get there. Um, the other transaction I wanted to mention is yesterday the Red Sox were called Mar- were called Marco Hernandez from Pawtucket. Yes, which my guy. In part, um, was due to the fact that he's the only infielder left on the forty. <laughs> Not true. Factually incorrect. There's a guy in Double A, Joey Curletta. Oh, sh- damn it! Damn it! <laughs> damn it! Good call. Yep. Um. Yeah, yeah, he, yes, he is. He's the but only. Yeah, he's the only guy that they were going to call up. Um, well, because he's re- he was replacing Mitch Moreland, so Curletta, in theory, was in fact possible an right. option. Yeah. Um, well, no, but it makes sense because they can just as they we, they've done they move Shavis to first base full time because they don't have any other first baseman. And they've got <laughs> a bunch of second basemen between Holt Nunez and now Marco Hernandez. Correct. So it makes sense to have Shavis at first, although. I mean, hey, you know, Marco Hernandez, it's a great story. He, it's almost, it, was, it had been almost two years since he had played in Boston. Um, and early in 2017, hurt his shoulder, missed almost the entire year, literally missed all of last year. And this year was rehabbing first in Salem, then in Pawtucket. Um, he had been optioned, but it was rehabbing. Hit, hit really well in Pawtucket, too. Um, hit very and, well. I mean, in, he, in Salem, frankly. I mean, he's hit. Yep. He's always hit. That's yes. like. Like every year since the Red Sox acquired him for, I don't even remember who. Oh, Felix Dubron, that's who it was. Which is crazy um, to think about, given yes. how long ago that was. That was he's December hit, of 20, 2014. Yeah, he's hit every year. He just has never been able to stay on the field consistently. I mean, yep. the most at bats he's ever had in a year with the Red Sox is like he had won 400 or 450 at bat season, but since 2015, it's been, you know, like 280, 50, zero. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so it's just – I mean it's good to see him back healthy. And frankly, if you start looking at the options they have at second base right now, just strictly bat-wise, you could make a case that he's the best with Shavis playing first base full-time. Yeah. Like, I mean, and we're seeing – I mean, he's got a – I think he's got five hits already. and Or sorry, two he's, – he's got a couple doubles already. And I think he's starting again tonight, today, which is a little interesting to me um, yeah, that, same. you know, they've recalled him and he started two of the three games already. So he might be sticking around. I mean, they, they're I, probably they're probably trying to see who stays up. Um, well, I mean, they think they kind of like what we talked about in the last time. They have to like see what they have. Yeah. Oh, this is can't. interesting. Apparently, Darwinson might be a candidate to start on Tuesday. I saw that, but I mean, they're at a point where like they obviously have gotten hot. They've been very streaky, but they got to figure something out. Like that, you know, they need to <laughs> they need to start winning games. Like mm-hmm. they can't, you know, they can't keep playing 500 ball forever. And if they think he gives them the best chance to win, then, you know, they might as well do it because they're six games back already and that can't get any more. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, it, we'll, we'll see. Um, I'm just, I'm just interested to see how they use him. And the fact that he started two or three games since they called him up though, I just think is interesting. Yeah. A lot of injury notes. Okay. Here we go. I was trying to find the, the lineup. Uh, Hernandez is in at second base, but that said, uh, Nunez is playing third. They're giving Devers a day off. But they play um, a lefty today. Yeah, it's Blake Snell. So, I mean, but yeah. they trust them to face a lefty. It's a good sign. Yeah, yeah. Um, and also some injury notes. Zue Lin starts a rehab assignment today in Pawtucket. Yep. Uh, Tyler Thornburg starting a rehab assignment in Pawtucket. Uh, apparently, Stephen Wright's going to start a rehab assignment in Pawtucket tomorrow. Yavaldi had a setback. Yavaldi had a – did he have a setback? Is yeah. That, I missed that one. He announced it today. Mm, fun. And then Brian Johnson, his rehab assignment is almost up. On so Thursday, right? it's going to be interesting to see what they do with him. I suspect he'll get called up and take over in the Mike Schwarren, Josh Smith role, one of those two. Right, right. But I don't know. You mean Mike Schwarren who – I mean maybe we should mention this briefly. What the hell is the deal there? They called him up and he didn't pitch for a week. And then hasn't he pitched back-to-back days? 
Well, now he has. Yeah. I mean, he's thrown well out of the bullpen, so but we're kind of seeing his limitations also. Like, this, the role they're using him right now, frankly, is the role that I think he should be used in full time. Like, he's pitched back to back days, two innings, seven strikeouts, one hit. Yeah. Like, I'm sorry, four innings, seven strikeouts, one hit. I mean, to like, me, Ian, the, the, the way they've used him shows they don't think he's a starter. No, he's not a starter. Well, that's, but that's we, what I'm we, saying. I've been saying mean, that for years. Right. And, and you, we, we would get, you know, but I think it, it would be it put is, back on us that like, oh, well, but, you know, but his stats, this is why you like, don't just go on stats. No, but I think it's just, it does show that they don't, I don't think they view him as a starter, as you said, yep. because they've called him up and they're throwing like Ryan Weber started a game instead of him. Josh yep. Smith is in the rotation now. Like they, they know what, they know what people, they know what they're seeing. They know what they're doing. And yeah, he can't turn a lineup over. He doesn't have a third pitch. Like, but the guy, pitchers with his type can be successful. See the Tampa Bay Rays, who have turned like Jalen Beeks, Ryan Yarborough, and Yanni Chirinos into like borderline all stars. Right. Like, well, at least Yarborough looked like that against the Red Sox yesterday. I mean, Yanni Chirinos. He, he wasn't having a good year. Yeah. Chirinos is legitimately like a borderline all star, though. But yeah, like the, the point is they're valuable pieces. And like, I think Schwarn could be that, but in the role he's being used in now, that's mm-hmm. the thing. Yeah. So that's yeah, interesting. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we'll have to keep, and I guess just to check in on one more thing in the majors and then one curiosity that I want to mention, Michael Chavis, we're back in slump mode. Um, while I bring the numbers up, I mean, it's, you know, I I don't want to sound like I'm doubting him because I'm not, I, I want, you know, when we say these things, we just, we're pointing them out, but you know, Chavis at this point, I mean, I guess he doubled yesterday, which was good. Um, drove in two runs, had two hits the day before that. But since, let's see, he pulled out of his last slump, but like since May the 17th, 212, 272, 353, uh, 18 hits and 85 at bats, 35 strikeouts and 92 plate appearances. That's, you know, 38% strikeout rate. Yeah. I was going to even go, I was going to bump it. If you go from like May 23rd, which is Mm -hmm. when he lasted his home run the day after that, He's oh, is two, that his last home run? Yeah, okay. His last home run was May 22nd. Okay. So if you go from the next day, he's 200, 262, 250 with 28 strikeouts and 60 at-bats. Six, and 65 plate appearances. That's a 43% strikeout. Yeah. Right? Like, I mean, he's we overmatched know, right now. And this is the thing. I mean, I've, I think I mentioned it. I don't remember. I think it was on the podcast, but it's also something like Red Sox stats and I've kind of gone back and forth on Twitter is Chavis cannot hit high fastballs at all. No, and the, the story's and getting team, out. And teams are starting to figure that out. And mm-hmm. they're just pumping velocity up in the zone to him. And part of it's his swing path. I mean, he has a huge uppercut swing, but like he's got holes in his swing and he, the teams are starting to expo- expose it now that they've seen him, you know, the first time through. And Chavis was never like a pure hit tool guy either. Nope. Like, you know, he was someone who in his best years, I think is going to hit like 250, 260. So like he's obviously was always going to regress, but now it's on him to, you know, kind of make an adjustment back to the league because the league has clearly started to figure him out. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, hey, I, I mean, hopefully he makes an adjustment, especially given the state of first base right now. If he's not your first baseman, Sam Travis is. Yeah, they. Um, I mean, we they should we should mention Moreland injury looks kind of bad, right? Didn't they say it could be a while? I mean, it was a hamstring. I mean, for the people who said he came back too quick, it's a new injury. Like yeah. it's a different injury. It was his back, and now he's hurt his hamstring. Yeah, it's, I gonna, it was it's quad or quad. I mean, it's a leg. But I'm just yeah. saying, like he was out with a back injury before. This isn't Dustin Pedroia coming back too quickly and his knee not being healthy. This is. You know, the guy came back and hurt something else. So, yeah, first base yeah, is kind right of an issue. Bottom. First base is kind of an issue. Uh, yeah, right well, now because for this Pierce team. is also out. So, and he's going to be a while. They said so. Really? Yes. I mean, they, it's Chavis, and I mean, as we said, Joey Curletta is on the forty man. I mean, is it at the point where you? I mean, you, uh, I, mean, I, I guess you, Sam Travis. We, well, I was going to say something else. What? Do you do it? I mean. At some point, do you just consider calling up Josh Ockamy to play only wow. against right-handed pitchers? That's like, an interesting I, thought. Just right. Like, if he faces a lefty, you're doing a disservice to him. But, like, at some point, I mean, granted, he has slowed down. I'm looking. He slowed down considerably. In, Strong in, uh, side of a platoon. But, I mean, he's slowed down considerably even against righties, actually. Like, he's in a big slump right now. Is but, he? I mean, yeah, he's down to 209 for the year. And he hit 190 in May and 172 in June thus far. But, uh, I mean, he still can – he has power against righties. Like, 
I don't know. It, it's just something I don't. I'm not. I'm not there yet, but it's something. And Sam that, Travis's numbers are just so pedestrian this year. That's what I mean. Like I don't know if you can afford to like run a lineup out there with. Sandy Leone, Sam Travis, the way Jackie Bradley's hitting oh, right now. Oh, I guess in May, Travis hit 278, 364, 433. It's not so, terrible. I mean, in the majors, I mean, he's one for eight. And But I'm looking at his splits in the Pawtucket. Like, he's destroying lefties this year because he always does. And against righties, he's hitting 220. This is Travis? Yeah. Yeah. Travis, yeah. yeah. For the year against lefties, 317, 349, 433. Um, but right, always been get him. Him. right yeah. with righties, he gets got. I want to see Josh Ockamy's game. He's lock. really slowed down late. Yeah. All right. So lately, let's pick an arbitrary endpoint. Ian. It's my favorite. Although thing he's, to do. he's, he's got home runs this month. It's just, yeah, no, he's just the average isn't there. Oh man. Yeah. So like, yeah. Ugh. Yeah. If you go like May 22nd, 161, 310, 321. I mean, the pop's still there. And the OBP's still there. It's just he's not getting hits. I mean, but I mean, then we I mean he also... walked 13 times in 18 games. He also struck out 21 times in 71 at bats. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's just leaning into three true outcomes this year. Right. Which, I mean, there is a place for that type of player in the league, but it's just, I don't know what they're going to do because if, if they just, they're thin. I mean, and that's kind of the, what happens when you trade all your prospects and you <laughs> kind of go with like a stars and scrubs approach. Not stars and scrubs. That's well, a bad it's not even say. stars and scrubs. It's that they they basically brought the band back from last year, save for Kimbrel to yeah. save money. So okay, the bullpen th- is what it is. But it's like you bullpen got... hasn't been a problem though, really. Well, I mean, I mean it, it has. hasn't. It hasn't. I mean, they've they've been mixing and matching in that middle area where if they'd had someone at the top to push everyone right. down, it would have been great. But. You know, you look at it and it's like you had a lot of guys like, like Mookie Betts hasn't hit as well as he did last year. Rafi Devers is having the season of his life and he's going to be an all-star. Ben um, Intendi hasn't hit as well as Bogart, last year. Well, right, but then Bogarts is having his, probably his best season as a pro. Yeah. Um, but that's the trade-off, but it's just you don't have any depth. That's the thing. Yeah, you there's just, no depth. Like, I mean, you look at the 40-man, like Weber's on it. I mean, if they add Ockamy, they probably DFA Curletta. Yeah. Would be my guess. I mean, yeah, they could do him. Is there or... a 40? I mean, I guess you could DFA Oscar Hernandez. No, you need a third catcher, though. Yeah, but they have Centeno. They have... True. Um, I mean, I, I, could, I just... I mean, Weber, Josh A. Smith. I, I think it would be one of the pitchers, frankly. Yeah, I probably. Just, I mean, they're starting but, to run out of the obvious guys. It's just, at some point, you know, you have to, at least that's the empty mind if he starts hitting again, because... You know, if Chavis doesn't turn it around and you don't want to be playing Sam Travis every day at first base. No. So no, just 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 something that popped into my head when you're we looking at the first base yeah. picture. No, that's an interesting thought. I, I like where your head's at. I just I don't know if they pull the trigger. But anyway, that's news. The other news is kind of a curiosity that I wanted to mention. Um, <laughs> Dylan Hardy. Dylan Hardy is a guy who they draft the Red Sox drafted last year in the thirteenth round. He actually got um, full slot of 125k for an after 10th round pick uh, outfielder out of South Alabama. He was a junior top 500 for baseball America's draft prospects. Um, you know, as a, as a junior at South Alabama hit 331, 409, 444. I kind of like him. He's sort of athletic. He's a good org outfielder. Uh, last year in Lowell didn't hit that great 167. Um, this week was called up to Pawtucket from Portland and he's actually played Ian. So that means Dylan Hardy has played for all four single season affiliates this year, um, which is kind of crazy. This hasn't happened as far back as I can remember, particularly talking about, you know, a guy who's not rehabbing. Sometimes you'll get a guy who's rehabbing. Like I remember, I think like John Lester when he was rehabbing from, well, I guess not rehabbing, but building back up after fighting what was it, with leukemia that he had, um, working his way back up, I think stopped at every level perhaps, but like, I've never seen this. It's just kind of a curiosity. I mean, true talent wise, he should be probably in Greenville, but um, yeah, Dylan Hardy has now played a game in Salem, Greenville, Pawtucket and Portland uh, for the season. So I just thought it's kind of interesting. Uh, You know, it's a guy, it's it's an org outfielder thing. Usually they don't do this to guys with four levels. Usually it's like two, maybe three, Um, but poor uh, Pawtucket, obviously at this point, I mean, the Pawtucket roster is kind of a mess. They've got, 
you know, th- they had 22 guys active on the roster going into today, but now they've got all kinds of rehab and guys coming in and they had guys coming up from, you know, Portland, uh, you know, you've got Dylan Hardy up there. So they're mixing and matching and they'll make it work. But yeah, I just thought that was kind of interesting and wanted to mention it. So good, good on you. Good for you, Dylan Hardy. Uh, your name will live on forever. Um, let's move on into the draft recap. Uh, if folks want to hear our specific thoughts on the top two picks in this year's draft, that'd be uh, infielder Cameron Cannon out of, out of out of Arizona and infielder Matthew Lugo out of Carlos Beltran Academy in Puerto Rico. Um, download the Draft Day One recap podcast that we did on Monday night uh, slash incredibly early Tuesday morning. But th- today we just wanted to hit a little bit more on our thoughts on the full draft. And Ian, uh, very interesting what they did for those who who don't know off the top of their head. Check out draft, our draft history page. That's SoxProspects.com slash DH is the easy way to get there if you don't want to do it from the front page of the site or DH.htm, I should say. Um, so do it from the front page of the site. But uh, Cannon and Lugo on day one. On day two, the Red Sox picked at 107 um, and the last pick of the third round and every 30 picks thereafter. Uh, went entirely college on day two, Ian. That'd be pit rounds three through ten. Uh, I guess including yeah. a Juco um, teacher. Yes. But entirely college on day mm-hmm. two, which is I mean, they basically they did the same thing last year, right? Yeah, it's not surprising. Yeah, it's not surprising. And, and really, it's a trend across baseball where high school players are being drafted less and less often because they're seen as such a risk. Well, um, it's also, I think it's, if you're good, if you're a high school player, the money. yeah, you get taken in the top three or four rounds. Mm-hmm. And then for the rounds, like five to 10, because you have to, you have to be signable and you yeah, as you said, it's risky. You take the college guys and then you come back afterwards and take the high school guys again after rounds eleven to forty, where, you know, if they don't sign, it's not doesn't cost you anything bonus wise and it's less risk, as you said. Yeah. Yeah. So in entirely college on day two. Um, highlighted by the third rounder, Ryan Zephyr John, right hander out of Kansas. Uh hard throwing right hander, Ian, go figure. Uh, but yeah, he sits in 93 to 96 mile per hour range, has hit uh, 98 in shorter stints, um, you know, flashes uh, inconsistently on the slider and change up. Uh, he has apparently already signed to a below slot deal. Slot for that pick was 543 yeah. uh, and a half. Uh, he signed for 500K. So the Red Sox saved $43,500 on that pick there. Um, the other pick I really wanted to mention. Probably the most, not probably, for me, the most interesting pick of this draft. In the fourth round, the Red Sox took a right-hander out of the Naval Academy uh, by the name of Noah Song. Song is one of the Golden Spikes finalists for the best player in college baseball. Because he's a senior, but talent-wise, late second, first, slash, late first, slash, second round pick. Right, yeah, you should have gone, like, comp round, early second round. But the problem is, because he's at the Naval Academy... He has a service requirement, a service commitment, and he's actually being sent to flight officer training in Pensacola, in Pensacola beginning in November for two years. Yeah. Um, and this is like – this isn't something where he can split time. This is like a full-time two-year yeah. commitment. And it's – for those who – I know a lot of people are saying – and I was on the uh, Hardcore Baseball podcast uh, for 98.5 with Matt McCarthy the other day, literally at the same time that Ian was on with Adam Jones on 98.5. But we were talking about it, and you know, the, the, a lot of Boston sports fans might say, is, "Well, Joe Cardona, right, of the Patriots, the long snapper, who um, basically has an exemption from his service requirement as long as he has signed a professional sports contract and is like not advertising, but the word like um, um, representing, representing, or promoting, yeah. promoting, promoting naval academy the services, yeah. yeah, the services. Yeah. Um, that was an Obama. I can't believe we're talking about." executive policy on the Sox prospects podcast, but, but here we are. It's well, the executive in, policy edition of the Sox. Well, you live prospects in DC too. That's so. true. That's true. Um, but yeah, so I, that was an Obama era policy where you could apply for an exemption. If you were under a professional sports con- contract, president Trump comes in and ended that policy, but he's also, but he has about now talked about reinstating it. So truggy face. So who knows? Who knows? Um, Everything I've read, the interesting thing is everything I've read is that Song takes his service commitment very seriously. 
part of the reason he didn't sign last year is that it was basically he was like, look, I need first round money to sign me out of this commitment. He wasn't um, drafted last year, I don't think, right? Well, he basically said, don't bother drafting me. Yeah. If you're not going to take me in like the first round. Yeah. Um, but it's interesting, too, because I guess when he went to the Naval Academy, he wasn't a big prospect. It was like his sophomore year or something that he came in and was like, yeah. oh, he's pumping 95. That. Like, yeah. interesting. His stats were good like his first year, but he didn't strike anyone out. And then all of a sudden, his sophomore year, he's striking a lot of people out. And mm-hmm. now he's striking everyone out. Right. So he's, I mean, he, he's built up over time. He did not enter the Naval Academy as like a professional baseball prospect. So that's why this kind of changes the, the, you know, the, the calculation. It seems like he really wants to go to flight officer school. Um, and apparently the thing is he apparently can't actually fly the helicopters cause he's too tall. There's a height maximum. He's like six, five or something. Yeah. And it? I guess he's, he's, he said he's like a centimeter and a half too tall. Yeah. Um, which by the way, this is kind of interesting. The reason they have the height, do you know why they have the height requirement? It's not necessarily a fitting in the cockpit. No, so you don't hit your head when you're getting in and out, right? No, it's not. It's not. Uh, Or at least this is part of it. So it's kind of funny. A bit of a tangent here. A couple of years ago, my wife um, was interning at the Coast Guard JAG in Boston, um, which for those who don't know, it's like right next to, um, what is it, uh, James Hook? Hook Lobster. Hook Lobster. Best lobster rolls in Boston. No question. No yeah, question at all. I go there all the time. <laughs> yeah. Whenever I went to see my wife at the time I was still eating meat, I'm like lobster roll hit me. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so my, one of my wife's co-interns was a former Navy helicopter pilot, like legit badass, flew missions in Iraq. Great guy too. Um, that summer they had like an outing at six flags in Springfield. And I went on Bizarro, the big roller coaster, right? Bizarro, it's like formerly Superman Ride of Steel, but then they changed it because they had some kind of accident or something. But it's Bizarro. They have a height maximum for this roller coaster, right? And they have, you know, they have this like PVC pipe thing that you have to get under. They like swipe it over your head. And for me, I made it under, but it like hit my hair. Like it moved my hair as it went by. And I'm just like, okay, I have no idea why this is there. I won't raise my hands. Like apparently there's like a tunnel or something you go in. We go on the ride. I'm having fun. All of a sudden, the ride ends. And I feel awful. I Apparently, my wife looks at me and I look like I'm green or white or whatever. Like, I've turned a different color. I'm sick as hell. We get off the ride. I'm groggy. And I look over. And there is, in fact, a tunnel. And I'm like, I don't remember going through that. Apparently, the G-forces were so strong that they, like, pull the blood out of your head easier if you're taller. Because I guess you have the same volume of blood in you. And this, so we asked this guy who's the former pilot, and he's like, that's why there's a height limit on pilots, because like the G-forces will make you lose consciousness, and it's easier to lose consciousness if you're taller, that's because fun. the G-forces affect you worse. So That's fun facts with Chris Hatfield. It's the executive policy slash physics funhouse yeah. edition of the Sox Prospects podcast. Anyway. But I, I think on, on song – Given the limitations they were working with, it, it makes perfect sense why they took him. Yeah, like, oh, for sure. Like they're getting a talent that would be cost them way more and have gone way earlier if he was signed. If the, obviously, the situation we just talked about was there, but they already were, you know, down. They didn't have a first. Well, they technically had a first round pick, but it wasn't in the first round. Yep. And they obviously had no extra picks. They had the smallest slot. So they're getting a talent way beyond the money they're going to spend to sign him, assuming they sign him. Right. And that's exactly what they needed to do. And I think it's kind of a trend we saw continue in the second day, too, is taking guys who maybe are a little riskier for whatever reason mm-hmm. or very risky, frankly. But, you know, if they can sign them and get them in, get them in the system, then there's definitely significant upside there. And I think Song is a perfect example of that. Well, it's like you said, it's like you're planning on him having Tommy John and missing two years. Yeah, that's what I said on the radio is that, you know, guys miss two years. See, Jay Groom, for example, is likely going to miss two years. You know, missing two years isn't the end of the world. And so obviously it's not ideal. And if somehow they can get him in the system sooner. And I think he looks like he might pitch in Lowell if he signs because he obviously doesn't report till November. Til November, yeah. So he might get some time this year. But if he misses two years, it's not the end of the world. And then, you know, he'll come back with a fresh arm in a couple of years. Yeah, it's less than ideal, but the upside is a lot better than anything else you would have gotten at pick 137. Exactly. And I'm, his bonus is going to be fascinating because yeah. talent wise, it should be way over slot. But who and isn't knows? Boris his advisor? No, it's not. I oh, thought it's not. it was. It's not. Oh, okay. But right. like talent wise, it should be way over slot. But 
Yeah, but then like he has uh, zero senior. leverage. Yeah, he's a senior who's going to miss two years most likely. Like, yeah, he's a college senior who is going to be gone for two years, and it's like, okay, you don't want to sign for this amount of money. Yeah, good luck so, signing with the team in twenty twenty one. I don't know, so it's going to be. I'm interested to see what he. I think he said he wants. He's going to sign though, so it's no, like, of course he is. They know. I mean, they know the number. So yeah, we'll see. What uh, apparently, Reed Gregnani, who's the kind of mid Atlantic scout now for the Red Sox, mid Atlantic amateur scout, was at almost every one of his starts. And has that's, apparently done his homework. So, I mean, that's what you want. That's why. That's what you want. That's out good of your scouting. Staff. Yeah. But that's. I mean, that gives the Red Sox their top four picks were all consensus top one hundred talents. Which, given where they're picking, is pretty impressive. That's good. That's good. We like it. Um, and then interesting, I guess, just to mention day three, which is picks eleven through forty. Um, well, can, let's, can we mention a couple other guys in this top range that I think are kind of okay, interesting? Okay, yeah. Who do you who you want to talk about? Um, just just the fifth round pick. I just thought it was interesting. They took the battery made of Ryan Zephyr John <laughs> and Jax Groshans, and who's double X in the name, kind of badass. But um, he also is the brother of uh, Jordan Groshans, who was the first round pick of the Blue Jays last year. Mm-hmm. So I thought that was mm-hmm. worth mentioning. Yep. And then uh, the seventh round pick is kind of interesting to me yeah. too. Brock Bell. He's yep. the son of Jay Bell, mm-hmm. or is it David Bell? Jay. I can't remember. No, Jay. Jay. Yep. of Jay Bell, the ex um, MLB player. And he's committed to Auburn, which is obviously one of the top baseball programs in the country. It's where Casey Mize went, for example, who was the first overall pick last year. He already had Tommy John surgery and missed basically most of last year and just came back this year recently and has only made, you know, seven appearances this year. Yeah, all out of the bullpen. Yeah, and he struck out 23 guys in 13 innings. Um, <laughs> is that good? Which is, which is pretty good. He also gave up 17 hits. But... Right, but... It's just, you know, he seems like he's got a big arm and obviously well, he's, he hasn't he's up to 97. Much. Yeah. And he hasn't pitched very much because Tommy John. Yeah. So it just was an interesting pick to me. And it's someone who like, again, you know, the upside is there. It's just mm-hmm. there are questions that cause him to fall. But the Red Sox are trying to take advantage of that leverage because right. they didn't have a lot of to work with. So mm-hmm. I thought he was yeah. worth mentioning. Yeah. No, that he, he is intriguing to me as well. Um, and then I'm sure someone that we're not even thinking about, like the sixth rounder was left-hander Chris Murphy out of San Diego, who was a junior, top 200 guy for BA and perfect game. Yeah. Um, Bell was a top 200 guy for perfect game. You I know, mean, even Will Dalton in the eighth round is like a top 300 guy who has big power. Guy, but yeah. he, he fits their trend of taking guys with big power who have down years in their draft yeah. year, like yeah. Bobby Dahlbeck, for example. Yeah. And Mike Schwarn, another one. Because, you know, as a, what was it, last year at Florida, it, he had 19 home runs. I mean, he hit 260, but he had a 550 slug this year. Only seven home runs, 430 slug. So yeah. you never know. You know, if you can figure something out with the mechanics, as so we've seen ball back, then you could have hit big there. Yeah, I mean, Stephen Hargett's their guy in, in northern Florida who, I mean, they've taken plenty of players out of the University of Florida over the yes. years. I mean, you look in the system right now, Brian Johnson, Austin Maddox, um, Sean Anderson, Bobby, Bobby Pointer. Yeah. Um, I'm sure I'm forgetting others. But they, they take guys out of Florida. Jeff with some, Yeah, with some regularity. And so Harjit definitely has a relationship there, and they they trust him. So who knows? Maybe they're on to, like, maybe there was something he tweaked or something like that. Well, that's and that's kind of the unknown. And we saw with Dahlbeck. Like, he showed up in Lowell with a completely different stance because right. he just changed his swing back to what he was comfortable with, not what he was to being do. told. But the same with Durant. Yeah. Duran has gone back to the mechanics he's comfortable with, not what he was told to do it in college. And that's mm-hmm. something, you know, you don't really know until you get the guy into your system what's, right. what's going to happen there. Right. Um, well, let's move on to day three really quick. It's interesting because we, we – apparently the trend that a lot of teams had this year, speaking of high school guys, is the high school guys they would have picked late on – like on day two to get a given over slot bonus. They basically punted them into day three. Yeah. Which has the effect of – if you don't sign them, you don't lose anything off your cap. Correct. And it also has the effect of, you know, it's kind of interesting. Like, yeah, you get more slot money to sign them on day two. So, for example, but it's honestly not that much more. If you look, no. the Red Sox sixth round pick was $237,000. That's the slot for the pick that they took Chris Murphy at, right? Yeah. That's only like 114 no, $112,000 more than they would. Thank you. The maths, I'm good with them. Uh, but that's only a little bit more than they have for slot value, quote-unquote, for a guy after that. And if you're saving money on day one with a pick, like saving forty three grand on Zephyr John, who knows what they're going to save on Noah Song. Or um, Cannon. Or, or maybe Cameron Cannon they save a little bit of money on yeah. on day one. Um, you know, Their ninth and tenth round picks look like guys that they're going to save money on. 
who knows? Um, but you know, you could punt that money into the next day and have less risk that you're not going to sign someone. Case in point, the 11th round pick, first pick on day three was North Andover High's own Sebastian Keene, a right-hander committed to Northeastern. Consensus top 200 draft talent. Mm-hmm. It's going to take an overslot bonus. We're hearing maybe not as much as one might think, mm-hmm. uh, but you know, that's a good, I mean, chance, he's... good chance to add some talent there on a high school kid as opposed to what they've done recently, really more... I mean, I guess last year the 11th round pick was also a, a high schooler in, in Nick Northcutt. But, you know, the picks like 12 through 16, 12 through 14, 15 have usually been high upside college guys. They went mostly high school guys in those rounds this year. Well, I think it was just the interesting thing to me is the high school pitching. Because, mm-hmm. you know, obviously heading yeah. into last year's draft, they had taken a high school pitcher in the top 10 rounds every year since 2004. Last year, they didn't take one until the 28th, 29th round. Mm-hmm. And I don't believe they signed a single high school pitcher last year. I will double check uh, you. Um, I'm almost positive. But so the, this year, obviously, in the first 10 rounds, again, they didn't take any high school pitchers. But then they come back in rounds 11 to 20 and go or to start the second day. And they go high school pitcher, college pitcher, high school pitcher, high school hitter, high school pitcher. Mm-hmm. And so they just load up on high school pitchers right out of the gate. So I just thought that was kind of interesting. Yeah. Um, high, and, they took a couple of Juco pitchers, which yeah, is but, halfway. Yeah. So, and then I think with Keen, I mean, you're obviously looking at, he's kind of a Northeast guy, ultra projectable, mm-hmm. you know, there's some present feel there, but a lot, long way to go developmentally. But if he's someone, if you can get in the system, you know, get in the strength and conditioning program, there's definitely upside there. Another, another long time Red Sox scout and Ray Fagnot in the, in the Northeast. Yep. Yep. So that's well, also with him being that local, I'm sure a lot of the guys got out to see him too. Yeah, that's true. I mean, see him in like the super, I mean, he pitched in the super eight the day he got picked and knocked off the top seed in their division. So, um, but yeah, I mean, in the 12th round, they took a college sophomore. Um, the next one, two, three picks were all high schoolers, two pitchers and a first baseman, um, in Jordan Beck. And a lot of these guys, I mean, Jordan Beck, the 14th rounder was ranked 400th by perfect game. Aaron Roberts in round 15, high schooler out of Nevada, um, with a California commit is another top 500 guy. Uh, you know, a lot of top 500 guys kind of strewn about those rounds. You know, they... Which makes uh, me wonder if they're signable. Yeah, I, think I mean, they, they might know be. these guys. I mean, they, they've probably got an idea. I mean, maybe even if it's like, apparently... So the 16th rounder was a outfielder named Oraj Anu uh, out of uh, Wallace Community College in Alabama. If he sounds familiar, that's because they drafted him in 2017 as well as a homeschooled high schooler in yeah, North Carolina. Yeah, yeah um, now he's committed to Kentucky. Now he's committed to Kentucky. Program. But, I mean, he, he said he's a 50, like 50-50 to sign, I guess. Yeah. So I guess it just depends how much money they have to throw at him. So I think they're kind of loading up on like, okay, if this guy doesn't sign, we've got this guy. If this guy doesn't sign, we've got this guy. You know, they're giving, they're giving themselves options with yeah. the money to try and find upside given that they pick so late up at the top. Yeah, they have a lot of balance in the later rounds. And yep. I think, you know, obviously they kind of the strategy too, when it got to like the 28th round and later, things got kind of weird at that point. Um, yeah. In the 28th oh, round, God. Yeah. They there, took there's a, some weird ones. They took a guy named Daniel Bax, who's a shortstop at Stanford, except or he's was. a student at Stanford. He's not a shortstop because he didn't play baseball this year. He uh, took a year off. He took a year off. And so, I mean, he was, I guess I was reading an article that said he was pretty highly thought of uh, coming into the year. He's a two-way player, both pitched and hit. And there was some talk that if he played and played well, he could potentially move up into like the top five rounds. But he took the year off because of, I think he's, they said like fatigue. Just burned out on He just was sports. burned out from playing baseball. So like hey, who knows with him. But again, it's like if he's, you know, if the talent is in there, if they can yeah. get, him in the, get him in the system, get him committed, you never Why know. Why not? And then when we get into the thirties, that's where it got really weird. Uh, hey, you know, someone's got to replace Jeff Driscoll. Ian. Yeah. So they took three college football players. In the 30s. <laughs> and I'm like, like I'm talking about two of them have never, didn't even play baseball in college. Well, in the 31st round, they took Felipe Franks out of Florida. Oh, hate him. Huh? Sorry. M- Michigan played yeah. Florida. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, but like, I mean, he's Florida's starting quarterback, which is why yeah. I made the Jeff Driscoll joke, joke because they yeah. drafted Jeff, Jeff Driscoll while he was Florida's starting quarterback. But he was a highly regarded recruit coming out of high school. Yeah, just this like Driscoll. Drisc- oh, t- uh, oh, Frank's was Frank's too. Frank's was too. For, for, okay, yeah. for, uh, for, yeah. for baseball, he was like highly regarded pitcher, but right. played football. So who knows what they're going to do with him? And then, well, he says he says he has no interest in signing, but I guess is what they're going to do is say, hey. We'll give you 10K. Just we'll give you 10K. Come to spring training. 
yeah, one of these years. Like, like come to spring training, say hi, check us out. Yeah, kind of like what they did. Like work Shaq, out. Shaq, what is his name? Shaq Thompson Green. Yeah, well, or clearly what it is is that Brandon they've seen the success of Tim Tebow in the New York Mets system. <laughs> okay, I don't think it's that. Oh, okay. But, okay. But anyway, uh, and then the 33rd round, they took Thayer Thomas, who actually played baseball at least this year, but he's also the slot receiver on North Carolina State's football team. Mm-hmm. And um, so who knows there. And then in the 36th round, they took Caleb Hill, who's a tight end for Montana, and they don't even have a baseball team. So, um, But yeah, I don't know if it was Mike or Gabriel, but like the tweet they sent out from the Sox Prospects account, because you see like like a lot of the sites that cover teams were, were doing the like, you know, catchers to oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. first baseman good. for listed all the positions and then they were like quarterback one, one wide receiver yeah. one tight end one yeah i thought that was fantastic but um, i mean i kind of like it like you're not like frankly they're not gonna they don't sign a lot of guys in that round anyway right. like if you go back to last year's draft they signed two guys between browns 29 and 30 and 40 right so why not take these guys you know throw them a little bit of money and see I if mean, they'll come and just it, 2017 they sent from they signed their 27 29 30 31 32 33 34 35 36 round picks right just throw I mean, a little it doesn't money always go happens. that way i mean yeah. it depends what you've got room for right um so and i mean not? two of them the 29th rounder was tyler dearden who's still around the 31st rounder was michael osinski who's still around and the 36th rounder was rio gomez who's still around yeah and thrown really well so yeah i i don't know i just thought it was an interesting strategy yeah. that took those guys given how limited their baseball experience was how, how do you feel overall about the draft hall not obviously we don't know who they're going to sign so that this is really a a to be continued yeah. until july the 15th but i mean just going off the first 10 rounds, because I assume they're all going to sign, like yeah. given the, what they were working with, I like what they did. You know, they yeah. got a lot of lot more talent than I expected. They got basically an extra. They basically had an, they got an extra pick out of it with song. Like yep. it's like they had an extra like second round pick. Yep. So I was pretty I liked what they did there. If they can sign all the guys in like 11 to 20, there's some high school guys. There's some interesting like Juco guys. So, you know, there's definitely an upside. And Given what they were working with, I think they did. Uh, they they tried to get as much value as they could out of it, and they did a pretty good job, it seems. So it's going to be interesting to see who signs, as you said, especially with all the high school guys they took after the tenth round. Mm-hmm. And I think it's something we'll be able to like revisit better, um, you know, after the deadline in yeah. uh, mid July. And after we see these guys in Lowell, um, I'm excited. Yeah. I'm going to get to see Lowell once this year. Yeah, so. Lowell's. I mean, we'll talk about it probably in the next, next episode. Next but yeah, episode. Lowell's looking very deep this year. Yeah, yeah, and and honestly, I mean, it's look. This isn't an all timer class, but you weren't going to get that with your first pick at forty. No, they had the lowest slot bonus since they switched like the system, <laughs> like of any no, team. Yeah, of any team, yeah, like four point seven sense. million. Like no one has had it because obviously they had the last possible pick. They had no extra picks and they lost room with it. So, or they right. lost they, slots. They lost another 500 K when the, yeah. the pick moved back. Yeah. So like they, you know, they didn't have a lot to work with, but it seems like, you know, Mike Rick and staff, did a pretty good job going out and identifying guys that were, they could go out and get given the limitations they had and see what happens from there. Would be interesting to get his thoughts on that. Wouldn't it? It would be. Hmm. Interesting. Hmm. Okay. Uh, uh, emails. Huh? Um, well, we got rankings too. Do we want to hit on oh, that? Okay. Right. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Rankings. Let's hit yes. on rankings really quick. I mean, we're at we're at you know forty five minutes, so we won't we won't belabor the point. But we do have pretty big shakeup in the rankings, Ian. Um, we graduated Michael Chavis on June the first, so new number one prospect by default because there was there was no one in the system who'd already been a number one prospect. No one oh, yeah, had moved down right. from number one. Yeah. Um, and our number one prospect right now is Tristan Casas, who was also our May Player of the Month. Uh, <laughs> Because he's, yeah, he is absolutely tearing the cover off of the ball. Uh, for the season, Casas is now up to 263, 339, 495 with 10 bombs and just under 200 at bats. Uh, no question for me. Any question for you? No. I, I, I mean. And we should say, like, since May 1st, he's 298, 373, 579 slug with eight home runs in 34 games and only 32 strikeouts in 34 games. So. What if I condense that even? No, I'm saying he did, and that coincides with him shortening oh, yes, up his. Yes, 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 you yes. know, we we had tweeted the video from spring training, which we talked about how it made your head hurt, how wide yeah. he set up the plate. He's back to like a normal looking stance. Well, but this is what's interesting. Um, I'm just trying to bring something up. Okay. Uh, and with regards to that, so he yes, as you said, he still with two strikes, he still does the big wide split and um, the uh, what's it called. Uh, with, he still has that two strike. He he crouches down and does all that to shorten up. But it's just 
his first two pitches, he's now just more vertical and kind of just, yeah, getting yeah. starting narrower and hitting bombs. Yeah. So, yeah. but I guess with two strikes, he's still hitting really well. So it's one of those things that it seems to work for them. But in terms of like power and everything, he gets way more if he's doing the vertical straight up stance. Yeah. So he's, I mean, he's getting to his power. He's a South Atlantic League All Star. Um, That's the other thing we should mention. Hey, oh, there's yeah. a couple. Um, well, who the other two? The other two Thad were. Thad Ward and. Yeah, Thaddeus Ward and uh, it was a hitter. Who was it? Oh, uh, the Granberg. Devlin Granberg, right? Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, so three South Atlantic League All Stars for the Greenville Drive. Well, I was going to see if you wanted to guess who from the other teams would get it, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah whatever. No but cares. I think just on Costas, like, he's come around. He's doing. He's actually exceeding my expectations based on his first pro season. Mm -hmm. And the scout, scout, I've talked to scouts who've seen him, and they're all like, yeah, he's legit. Yeah. So. That's good. Yeah, he's by far the number one prospect for me right now. I think that behind him, there's a tier of three guys, um, mm -hmm. ranked two to four, who this was really kind of our biggest debate between you and me and Mike, was who to rank number two between Bobby Dahlbeck and Jaron Duran. We went with Dahlbeck number two, and I liked your, your reasoning behind that. And he's actually starting to show it out. He's, he's hitting more bombs, Ian. Uh, I'll yeah, pull the numbers still, up. I think he's leading the it. Eastern League in home runs now. It's just... Since the weather got like we talk about it a lot on here, and you know, some people might think we are like overstating it. The weather in Portland in May, in April, sucks. It's freezing. It's wet. It's just miserable, and it's hard to swing up. It's hard to hit with a wooden bat in that time. It's also hard to command pitches if you're a pitcher, and so that's why like Portland stats in April, I just write off for the most part. Since and, May one, yeah. two eighty, three ninety two, six sixteen, with eleven home runs in thirty five games, and he's only striking out. At a 39 divided by 148 is 26% clip, Just which I fine. can live with. If he's under 30%, he's fine. And yep. that's and that was kind of my thing with Dahlbeck is like I just, I just write off his April stats. And him, he's starting to hit in Portland. The Eastern League is, except for a few parks, see Redding, is kind <laughs> of a hard hitting environment. It's not the easiest hitting it's, environment. It's not Carolina League, but it's, no, I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's, not, it's, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's fine. It's like neutral ish. What is he going to do when he gets up to Pawtucket with that yeah, ball? I know. Like, it, he is the type of guy who will just, every fly ball he hits is just going to be a home run. Not yeah. really, but you know what I mean. Like, so that was the big thing for me is like, he's close. He's close to triple A. He's starting to hit. Like, the strikeouts are way down. He's a potential above average to plus defender at third base. That's a very valuable player in mm -hmm. this day and age. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're seeing like three true outcome guys can play. So, I mean, one thing yeah. that came to mind for me, Ian, is like if CJ Crone was an above average defender at third base. Yeah. I mean, there's like that's, if that's, that's, and that's not even like a, a top percentile outcome. No. But like if he's a guy who can hit, you know, 260 with 30 home runs and play above average defense at third base, that's like a borderline all star. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I for me, that was what kind of separated Dahlbeck is I just still believe in the bat. Right. Yeah, I think that sounds about right. Uh, I mean, it, and it's, look, we're really high on Jaron Duran, too. It was a debate. I mean, I think even, like, you were the one advocating for Dahlbeck, but it's not like you were saying it was, like, a landslide. No, I, and, and I mean, I, like, we were the people who saw Jaron Duran first, and we've been on him since <laughs> we saw him in Lowell. Like, we right. love Jaron Duran, you know. He was in our, I think he was in our top 20, like, he literally. Led, still leads the minor leagues in batting average, although he's starting to kind of, you know, since his promotion to, Port, promotion to Portland, um, he's been fine. Yeah, um, I mean, but been... that's it's. I mean, he's getting on base. He's not, but it's like it's like eighteen at bats, like whatever. Right. But I mean, it's yeah. Bats. So in, in in you know in five games, it's you know a one for three, a two for five, and then he's zero for his last ten. Yeah, but, like, but he's got I mean, four walks in those three games. Right. So it's going to take time to adjust, whatever. but I'm not concerned about him. It's just yeah. it's good to see him up in Double A. It had to happen, and he's kind of one where let's see, let's get the wheels rolling and see how he is in a month or so, and then we'll reevaluate from there. Yeah, and I mean, for me, it's if if Jaron Duran were to go to Portland and do what he was doing in Salem for a month, like, and by that I mean like hitting close to 400, then like, yeah, okay, you know what? At that point, I would probably personally start advocating a lot harder for Duran over Dahlbeck just because of the hit tool. But that said, I want to see what it looks like in Portland. We've talked right, about that exactly. Because um, yeah, Portland's yeah. the first time you're going to see those junk balling or guys who can spin a breaking ball and locate, but throw in like the low 90s, like that have been around forever. And that's kind of the guys when you're a little kind of aggressive, like he is at the plate. Those are the guys that are going to look to take advantage of you. Yep. Um, we moved our wins in Hernandez down to four from two, just because I think to me it's more Dahlbeck and Duran passing him 
Um, I mean, and Costas passing him, I guess, too. Well, Although Costas also, was was Costas already ahead of him? No, Costas was three. Uh, I don't know. I'll I'll look it up. I'll look it up. But, but I don't know. It's just a, a lot of. I've got a lot of reliever-ish notes on him from scouts and uh-huh. for what it's worth. I mean, in this year, it, he's struggled to throw strikes. I mean, he struck out 59 yeah. guys in 40 innings, but he has 32 walks in 40 innings. Yeah, Darwin's was number two, so we moved those three guys up past him. And so I've just – I'm getting a lot of reliever-ish vibes, and that's kind of what I've always thought. And, you know, I just – it's hard to guys potentially have like everyday potential at the plate versus a reliever. I'm going to take that over them, right. but he still has a chance to start, which is why he's in the top. He's still in that top, that neck, that tier. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it's, I mean, he's, he's slipping out of that tier for me. And to me, it's, you know, a clear top four, but it's also a clear top three um, for me of the guys who I like in the system after, after Darwin's in the end for me, it just got very kind of throw your hands up, shruggy face. Um, you know, we had uh, we we the, the, well. Let me just go with the rankings. The rankings after Darwin's and were Jay Groom at five, C.J. Chatham at six, um, Tanner Houck at seven, Anthony Flores at eight, Brian Mata at nine, Durbin Feldman at ten, um, rounding out the top ten. I, I don't know what to make of that tier um, because you know, just going down the list, Jay Groom apparently. Um, the latest update is that he's still in his 12 to 18 month window, but it look it looks more like it's going to be towards the back half of that window. Yeah, it's the longer. It's going to be. It looks frame. like it's going to be a long. You know, we had gotten a report of late May or through early August as a hopeful time frame. It looks like he's not going to be back in that time frame since that we're in it. Um, but you know, that's taking a little longer. And again, still not a setback. Just it's where he's at in his progression. C.J. Chatham is on the DL again after getting hit by a pitch on May 23rd. Um, injuries have always been an issue for him. Uh, still not hitting for a lot of power. It's a lot of the same. It's, it's you know, average to maybe above average tools across the board, save for the power. You know, I, I, I would like to see some progression with the staying healthy and with the pop. Tanner Houck at seven. It's, again, it's another, for me, Although he has been better of late, Ian, um, as I try and bring the stats up. But again, I'm, it's probably a reliever. Yeah, he's um, a reliever most yeah, likely. Yeah, I mean, it's a reliever. That's the reports we're getting. But that said, recently has been, you know, pretty good in since May 15th and five starts. It's, you know, 29 and a third innings. The ERA is not great at 338, but 32 strikeouts to eight walks. You know, I, hey, if they need a bullpen arm in August, it wouldn't surprise me if he's a guy they turn to yeah he's definitely going to be a consideration i would think so but yeah, yeah again it's like every I, it, this is i mean that you have to nitpick like this when you're doing rankings but you know once we get past those initial top four plus the shruggy face with jay groom mm-hmm. it's like every single one of these guys has a big question mark and then you look at the next guy like anthony flores anthony flores we were hoping like three games stateside in his career right like, right i mean he's going to lowell um, yeah. he is in Lowell. I have no problem saying that right now. That's out there. He's in Lowell. He's going to be with the spinners to start the short season. Um, I want to see what he does there. We were kind of hoping he might break with Greenville. Not um, break, but, not break, get, up but there. get up there. It looks like that's probably not going to happen unless he goes no. to Lowell and, and he's still super young. So it's not in the world. And then Mata at nine, we kind of talked about this. He missed another month. I mean, it's injuries it, with him too. But it also was it's a shoulder. The red flag. That's and <laughs> yeah. Shoulders are very bad having gone through major shoulder surgery. Like shoulder injuries are bad. Shoulder injuries are scary for pitchers. And so obviously he shoved this year, you know, it's thirty one strikeouts and twenty twenty nine innings, ERA like two, whip of close to one. And he came off the DL and threw five shutout innings. Mm-hmm. But he missed a month and, you know, right when we were doing the rankings, they said he was gonna come back and then strangely he just didn't come back. Right. You know. Right. And so, well, he wound right. up going to extended and throwing a rehab start. Right. But so it's just, you know, with him, it's, this is kind of the MO it's he, he'll throw really well at times, but then it's injuries. Then he'll come back and he's inconsistent. Then he'll go hurt again. And it's just, I, we got to see some consistency, both health and performance wise, but he's the one for me that has the chance to rise. If he, yeah. you know, continues to show up like he is. I was just going to say, if he has a, if he has a, a June, like his April, Ian, I could put him at five. Yeah, you could make the case he's like pushing the top five. Like I and then, put him at five just because I just I don't love the guys ahead of him if he's actually yeah. showing he can actually. I mean, if he's looking like he might start, 
if that cutter is good enough. I mean, yeah, okay, there's an arm action that we need to talk about. There's third yeah, pitches. I'm effort. not saying stats alone are going to get him there, but has another good month. Maybe but gets up to Portland. Well, and if we see, you know, we talk to people and see there's a better chance that he's a starter. Then there's not yeah. that. Then he's closing the gap between him and Darwinson, for example. Yep. Oh, for sure. So, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, Durbin Feltman at 10. I mean, you, you got to figure it out. Um, he's working on stuff. I'm not worried. Yeah. Like, I mean, I, he's working on apparently pitching. The, the um, I think Alex Spear had an article about it. And also Chris Smith wrote about it. I guess they were both at the same Portland game. But um, he's working on apparently in college. He just threw everything low in the zone, low in the zone, low in the zone. They're trying to get him to throw the fastball up in the zone. He's dialing it back a little bit to get a little more control of it. Cause he just, I mean, you can't just throw 97 by guys in double a. Yeah. Um, so he's working more 93 to 96, working on pitching up in the zone with that down in the zone, like in the cool. zone and out of the, out of the zone low with the breaking ball. He's also, uh, excuse me, working on refining his breaking ball too, because he's throwing both the slider and the curveball. And is he? Yeah. So I don't. Yeah, he's working on those too. There you go. So he's working on things, but again, with me, it's you know, if you've got a guy who's a reliever, I I mean, I think we kind of got a little excited about him because it's like the Red Sox drafting the guy who's almost major league ready out of last year's draft. Um. Which yeah, I, I don't think we never put him above like nine. Like we he did it, but I'm saying people got excited oh, because yes, that's yes, not yes, a guy yes, the Red Sox yes. usually draft. Correct, 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 correct. Sorry, so, yeah, yeah. You know, but I mean the whole thing. I mean, he's probably not going to be the first guy in the majors. Mize is probably going to beat him there. Oh, Mize is. Well, Mize, Mize is, might be. Mize, Mize would be a top sixty fifty pitcher in the game if you were in the majors. Right, Mize now. would be in the majors probably right now if he was not on the Tigers because they're terrible. Right, they're, so yes, that's true. They have no reason to call him up. Um, I guess I'll just list the 11 to 20 guys, Ian. You can tell me if there's anyone you want to talk about. But Brandon Howlett at 11, holding steady. Nick Decker at 12, same. Mike Schwarren, um, who we just talked about, is at 13. Alex Scherf at 14. Danny Diaz at 15. Gilberto Jimenez at 16. Nick Northcutt at 17. Josh Ockamy at 18. Travis Lakins at 19. Brian Bayo at 20. Um, we know that at least Jimenez and Northcutt will be in Lowell. Haven't confirmed that with Danny Diaz yet, but... Um. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, any 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 interesting things there for you, Ian? Not really. I mean, most of those guys haven't played yet, so not a lot really to mention there. Yeah, there really isn't. I mean, Scherf has been okay. Now, actually, he's been kind of regressing a little. No, he's bit been lately. bad recently. So it's yeah. I mean, for me, it's funny. Like this time of year is the time of year that we all like hate the system. Because it's just, we need more guys to talk about. We need an influx of talent. You've had guys graduating. You haven't really been replacing them. Yeah. Um, getting the new draftees in there will help. Um, mm-hmm. And I think we definitely were lowballing where the new guys are going to go on um, Monday night, I think. Maybe, yeah. yeah. I don't know. We'll have to look at we'll, it. We'll see when they sign and, and yeah. we'll talk about it. But, uh, yeah. Uh, and then, I guess, t- just to mention the big risers uh, after the top 10, uh, Thaddeus Ward is up to 22. Uh, he was uh, last month at 29 or 30, I guess, 29 if you take out Chavis. Um, but he's up another, you know, eight eight spots, I guess. Um, big month for him. He's the May Pitcher of the Month for the website, uh, for Sox Prospects at the website. Um, he right, also but, could rise more. He could. Because the reports on him are very good. Yep. Yep, definitely. And I think I was I, – well, let me just bring up his, his game stretch right now is ridiculous. I think it's his last, like – let me find it. Kind of surprised he hasn't gone up to Salem yet. I think I mean, well, that's he's, right. he's going to pitch in the All Star game. I think he's going to start the All Star game and then come up. But his last five starts, um, it's thirty two innings, thirty six strikeouts, four walks, allowed seventeen hits, and zero earned runs. Is that is that good? No earned runs in so a zero point zero zero ERA in his last thirty two innings. Thanks for clarifying the decimal yeah. points. Uh, th- this is the other thing. The <laughs> opponents are hitting 155, 212, 173 against him. So, yeah. All right. That's, That's pretty good. good. He should probably be in Salem. Yes, he should. <laughs> he needs to get the sound. So he'll throw. He'll probably pitch the All Star game and go up. I I said I I said it on Twitter that if he at the very latest he will be promoted as soon as the All Star game ends. Yeah, the All Star game is just going to take his stuff with him. Yeah. Um, also moving up, Ryan Fitzgerald moved up to 28. Uh, mm-hmm. Last month he was 37. And we should mention that uh, Fitzgerald, Castellanos, and a few other hitters have new scouting reports, so make sure to check those out, out yes. on, uh, on the player pages. By me. Yes. 
Um, so and we're yes. gonna do, we're gonna do pitchers soon as well. Um, yeah, and I, there's I, I have a few, and there's some more guys coming too. So we got yeah, the updates. Those are, are to come. those are starting to come in. We're starting to get the season updates coming in because yep. we now it's not you know a small sample, Sammy. We've yeah. actually seen and talked to enough people to have uh, another stuff. the biggest jump. Um, Kyle Hart entered the enter uh, in, in May was ranked fifty uh, fifth in the rankings. Uh, after his start to the year, he is now all the way up to 35. So yeah. I nice, mean, nice little jump for him. I mean, he's like an org guy, maybe like an emergency up and down guy, but he, I mean, he's got proximity and that's some, there's some value in that. So well, proximity, I mean, he's throwing very well. The scouting uh, uh, that we've heard is a little better. They've, they've tweaked. I think it was the cutter usage with him. Yeah. Um, yeah. so Kyle Hart, a big, big jump for him. Another big jump in the rankings that I want to mention is in Manuel De Jesus, who was 58 last month. He is now up 43. to 43. So big jump for him having a pretty good year in Salem. Mm-hmm. Uh, I saw him and it was still, you know, it was an orgy profile, but it was better than what we had seen out of him in the past. So, you know, yeah. performance well, I- and scouting wise moved him up. Well, I think with the rankings too, like a lot of these guys are going to get pushed out once the new yeah. draft these come. Plus, in. once we see who's in Lowell, see you get to see them live. We see what they've been working on, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, like there's some guys who well. in Lowell, like Osvaldo De La Rosa, and some guys lower down that if they come out in Lowell and sh- and show some stuff, that they'll move up pretty quickly. Yep. So, yep. Yeah, and so I think like yeah. We should maybe mention another riser was Edward Bizardo, who we also got an email question about. Did yeah. you want to? Well, let's just go right to the uh, email then. That oh. question was. Good transition, Ian. Thank you. Well, I mean, it isn't. It isn't. Let's see. That's not it. That's not it. That's not it. That's it. Okay. Yeah. So we got an email from Doug, and Doug says, How good is Edward Bizardo? Uh, they seem to be moving him slowly through the system and he has had great numbers at each level. Have you guys seen him in person? Thank you for everything you guys do. Thanks for the email, Doug. Uh, Ian, we, Ian seen him in person in Lowell. I just, no, the, I saw him last year in the instructs too. And instructs too. But I mean, just for Bizardo, I mean, he's been used as kind of a piggyback starter in Salem this year. Um, he's 23 years old, uh, September 95 birthday. Uh, he spent two years in the, actually, yeah, two plus years in the Dominican summer league, which is atypical for a guy who's, you know, really any good, especially because they signed him late. He signed his first pro contract on July 2 of 2014. He He was, he was not, yeah, 18 when he signed, uh, and played in the DSL, didn't play in the DSL that year. So he didn't make his pro debut until age 19. Yeah. So it's not really that he's been moved slowly. It's just that he signed very late. It's three years later than everyone else. Yeah, and, and then guys. so 2017, he started in the DSL, shoved, I mean, in 18 innings, 24 strikeouts, nine hits. I mean, he clearly didn't belong there. Went up to the Gulf Coast League. And then last year, he split, the, he split his time between Lowell and Greenville. So this year, he got pushed up to Salem at age 23. Uh, in Salem, he has been very good, Ian. Um, mm-hmm. Edward Bazardo. Yeah, I mean, Bizardo this year in, please load, 16 games, 37 innings pitched. Um, he has a 195 ERA, 47 strikeouts to nine walks in 37 innings. Uh, whip of 095, batting average against one uh, 190. Uh, the numbers have been there. But that said, has been moved into a bullpen role already on a team where Which you should they be. had a, room. Yeah, he's well, a reliever. Was, well, yeah. right. I mean, I was just prefacing like, you know, great stats. You, you know, the fact that he last year was in a starter's role after starting the year in a bullpen. This year they put him back in the bullpen role. Yeah. So what well, have no, you seen on him? La- last year he started the entire year. Did he? Yeah, in fourteen appearances okay, for all starts. Yeah. Oh, the year before is when he was pitching out of the bullpen. Yeah, yeah. but it. like, I mean, he's a two pitch guy. That's the biggest reason why I think he's a reliever. Um, mm-hmm. I like his curveball a lot. Like, I thought it was a potential plus above average to plus pitch when I've seen it. And he's got this really funky delivery that is really difficult to hit. But it's just there's no projection. He's like six foot, one hundred and sixty pounds, and he looks very skinny. There's just you know, the delivery's rough. Uh, velocity, I haven't heard. I I've, last time I saw him, he was up to like ninety five. So I'm not sure what it is this year. I haven't talked to anyone who's – That's no what he tops sitting. out at, right? That's yeah. not what he's sitting Yeah, yeah, But I've seen him up to 95. But people aren't – like no one's mentioned him to me when we've talked about Salem. So that doesn't 
yeah, necessarily. Yeah. Not I, don't, the, I didn't see him the three games I saw either, which was kind so, of So, I mean, I like the fact the curveball is good. The think. fastball has some potential, but I think it's a two-pitch guy. He's a reliever. The numbers are very good, but he's 23. Like, he's someone that, you know, maybe you can project, like, maybe a middle reliever. Um, I, there's definitely, like, major league potential. It's just I don't think there's a lot of upside. Right, right. But that's Edward Bizzardo. He, he did move up uh, this month. Last month he was ranked 45th. Um, he is now all the way up to 36, um, including, you know, Shavis dropping out ahead of him. So, um, a little bit of a rise for him. Um, let's continue with the emails, I guess, Ian. Yes. Um, our next email, uh, is one that actually slipped through the cracks. Sorry about this, Joe, but Joe, uh, said this in email on May the 10th that I somehow missed. And he said, in your recent podcast, you and Ian were not confident that Michael Shavis can maintain his stellar level of play. I seem to remember that you also expected Travis Shaw to fall to earth not too long into the first season he was called up. Could you compare and contrast these two players as your rationales for doubting them, Shaw then and Chavis now? Fair question. Thanks for the question, Joe. Mm-hmm. Um, Travis Shaw, a guy who we were a bit skeptical of. Uh, a couple of things, I guess, by way of background, Ian, and then I'll let you get into the substance of, of maybe the question. But um, Travis Shaw this season, I think we, I should have him in my history. It's bad. Travis Shaw. It's very bad. Yeah, but this year, I mean, let's see. Yeah, so uh, he came up with the Red Sox in 2015 in 65 games, hit pretty well, 273, 27, 487. But really, like, didn't seem like he was – I mean, I remember, who was it they called up that he was just kind of like – without prompt of saying, yeah, I guess they're not going to play me or something. It was something strange like that. Wasn't that Shaw? No, Shaw said that. Oh, gotcha. Um, I don't know. I don't remember. Devers, maybe? I don't know. Anyway, um, 2016 with the Red Sox and 145 games. I, I forgot he played this many games for the Red Sox that year. He basically played a full year. Hit, hit 242, 306, 421. His OPS plus was below 100, so he was a below average hitter. Um, split his time between third base and first base. And that really gets me to the first point is that when a guy is in the minors playing first base, and yes, they did move him over to third base to play a little bit there, but you don't project a guy who's playing first base to move back up the defensive spectrum. So the fact that he's been able to play third base in the major leagues is something that we did not see coming. Well, second base also. Well, on second base too, apparently. I mean, yeah. crap. I, I just, you know, so second, Brewers put him at second last year. He's played some second this year too. It's mostly just, third this mostly year. Mostly third yeah. this year. But it's just like that's not something you see coming, right? Um, he was traded to Milwaukee in the Tyler Thornburg deal. And in 2017, hit 273, 349, 513 with 31 home runs. Last year, he the hit what I think is a more true talent Travis Shaw year, which was 241, 345, 480. Again, with 32 bombs. Uh, but this year... Uh, he's been not good. He's been terrible at the plate. In, in um, 44 games, he's hitting 170, 282, 286, um, four home runs in 44 games. Not that we thought this was what was going to happen with him either, but really kind of crashing back down to earth. And I don't, I don't bring that up in an I told you so sort of way, but it's just like I still was skeptical on him being a true talent 240 with 30 bombs guy. Well, and I think that's the thing people are missing is like when you're talking about like someone's long term projection, it's going to be over the course of their career. You know, guys going to have outlier seasons where they had like incredible or career years as you know, they get called like and Shaw had his career year. I personally think back well, in 2017, 17 but, and 18 and 18 combined. He was like an eight win guy. Like yeah, that's, but that's, but like, that's going to happen. And that's not necessarily what his like ultimate career outcome is going to be. And obviously I think he's better than he's showing right now. But, you know, there's still the red flags like he couldn't hit lefties. He still can't hit lefties. And the defense is not great at any anywhere but first base. And it's like kind of like comparing bringing it back to Chavis or wrapping it back. Like, you know, they're going to have their they're both very streaky hitters. They both have power. They're going to they both can move around, like provide some defensive versatility. And I think, you know, Chavis is I wouldn't be surprised if Chavis has a year where he hits like 270 with, you know, 25 to 30 home runs. But if you're telling me the bulk of his career, I think he's more likely to end up in the like 240, 250 range. Yeah, I mean, he just missed about three weeks um, where he just came back from an injury, but he's hitting seventh in that lineup right now. Yeah. You know, he's not he's not a thumper. No. And that's and that's what frankly. And that's why, like, 
with like Chavis is the same thing. Like there's a reason Chavis wasn't seen as like a top 50 prospect in all of baseball or, you know, one of the top guys and why even in the Red Sox system, obviously he was the number one guy in the system, but I believe in some lists this off season, he actually wasn't the number one system. I, I think like baseball America didn't have him number one and a few other Who, Chavis Chavis. Yeah, no, he was, we talked about this. Cause remember like he it was not, there was not a consensus number one. So it's it was like Dahlbeck, Darwin's in. That, but that's what I mean. It's like, he's got the red flags, you know, he's got the swing and miss. He's got the, um, defensive questions. Like, that kind of shot in too. Mm-hmm. So, and then like profile wise, as I said, I think Chavis could have a couple of years where he hits, you know, 260, 270 with 30 home runs. But I think he also is going to have some years where he hits 230, 240 with 20 home runs. So right. that's kind of just the nature of the type of player he is. He's not a true pure hitter. Right. And neither right. is Shaw, frankly. And he what? I said neither is Shaw. So neither that's kind of like they, there are some similarities there for sure. Yep. Yep. So, but I mean, I mean, it's a fair question. I mean, it's not, we're not saying that we're absolutely right on all these. I mean, we were certainly low on Shaw, I think. Um, yeah, no, was, of course. You know, we, th- I don't think we're saying that we were right about him. I'm saying that, no. like, he but certainly he's, outperformed our projection. But that said, I think he's not as far ahead of the projection as he has shown. Yeah. Um, the past couple of years. Um, our final email comes from Ethan, and Ethan has two questions. Ian, the first oh, he first says, uh, "Thank you for providing the best slash most in depth coverage of the sock system." A couple questions. One. Under the Dombrowski reign, there seems to be a trend developing where the Red Sox will draft pitchers as starters who profile more as relievers in the majors. Have you noticed this trend? Um, so let's stop there, I guess, and answer the question, Ian. I think part of that is just that that's, I mean, unless you're picking in the top half of the first round, you're not going to have a lot of guys without some kind of question mark on whether they're going to stick as a starter. Yeah, if you're a starting, if you're a surefire starting pitcher, you're going to go like in the first round. And if you're not, you're a high school guy who who knows with high school pitchers, they go all over the place and some of them will go to college, like the guy from Vanderbilt yesterday who looks like a starter. But um, yeah, it's just, I mean, we're seeing it with the Red Sox and other teams. Finding starting pitching prospects is very hard. Like, yeah. that's kind of what it comes down to. And a lot of those guys, you can just, you're going to get there, you're going to get more value out of them in a bullpen role than you would, you know, as a up and down starter because a lot not many guys have a surefire you know major league starter projection right right and that's why you're seeing teams like we keep saying the reason the opener exists is because there aren't you know 150 major league starting pitchers right now you know what i mean there are like a number one number two number three number four number five guy isn't like starters one through 30 starters 31 through 60 starters 61 through 90 etc it's you know and, and obviously they're not going to be evenly distributed across the league but like that's not what it means like it just it means what you can expect out of the player performance wise and there just aren't 150 of those guys which is why you have teams using the opener so that they can use the guy who's going to throw five innings only facing the top of the order twice as opposed to three times yeah right? and then I mean, that's that's the, the raise, theory the rays are the best example of that like you look at the rays they have charlie morton who's probably a number two starter yep like in terms of baseball stats like then you have a bunch of they have openers and they bring in jalen beaks ryan yarborough yanni chirinos i guess yanni chirinos is a full-time starter now but it's Snell. like uh, and then snell's an snell's an ace yep. so they have an ace they have a number two and then the rest of the guys in their rotation it's a bunch of it's like openers and or it's openers and then all those other guys and you know Jalen Beast is a great example I mean he, I don't think I didn't think he was a starter I thought he could be a very yeah. good guy in the role they have him in which is like a swing man you know four or five inning guy and he's this year I'm gonna bring up his numbers right now um this it's year, he, good year. He's, yeah he's uh what is it 276 ERA in 49 innings um giving up 46 hits 45 strikeouts like it's a very it's like usable that, player what's the whip for Beeks? one two seven which is fine that's fine that's and true. that's the kind it's a kind of situation where if he was a you know if he was used as a full-time starter there's no way his numbers would be anywhere close to that good but in the role as you said where they're limiting his exposure to the top of the order and he's only you know turning the lineup over once or twice maybe mm-hmm. like it allows them to play to their strengths and that's because they're just as you said there aren't enough starting pitchers right right so it's interesting but yeah i don't think it's really a trend i think it's just it's i think it's more the recognition that like and it's interesting too, though, because it's like when Thad Ward got drafted last year, because I went back and looked at our draft coverage from last year, we were just kind of like, oh, they punted on starting pitching because the first true starting pitcher they drafted was Brian Brown. I think the other part of it is just that like they know what they need out of guys to make them starters. That's why right. Tanner Houck had his delivery and um, 
pitch mix completely Tweet. tweaked with. Yeah. Because they knew that's what he needed to stick as a starter. Yeah. Didn't completely well, take. So now hopefully he works out as maybe. Yeah. I think, I think the best higher. projection for him is maybe like a late inning relief pitcher. Yeah. Well, but, and I think too, we're seeing like teams are re- realizing though, that you don't necessarily need five starting pitchers in order to be successful because hmm. the goal is, the goal is not to find starting pitchers. The goal is to identify major league players. who can add value to your team in yeah. the best way possible. And teams are starting to realize that that's not necessarily might not be as a starter, you know, the best value or way to get value out of the draft for certain pitchers might be in that swingman role in the mm-hmm. bullpen, whatever. Mm-hmm. So it's just about getting, extracting as much value as possible out of the players. And right. there's just different ways to do that. Right. Right. In hindsight, I'm wondering if the Red Sox should have been using an opener for this fifth spot in the rotation. rather. Than... I would have been very pro that, but like yeah. use Ryan Weber to face, you know, the back end of the lineup or or use like Colton Brewer to face the top of the lineup and then bring in like Hector Velasquez for four innings like yeah. instead of just starting Velasquez things like yeah. that but yeah, yeah we'll never know uh, well anyways the second question that Ethan asked is what do you think the chances are that Jay Groom can eventually become an impact arm for the Red Sox at the major league level you guys have spoken at length about his potential but with the constant injuries and halt to his development do you think there's a really realistic chance he can reach it thanks for all you guys do Ethan thanks for the email Ethan uh, I mean, Ian, let me know if you agree with this, but I just think, you know, we have talked a little bit about this, where it's just, there's a, that's a huge question mark. And that is why he's ranked fifth right now in the system for us. And that's why I would have no problem pushing him down further if there were guys I liked better. Right. Um, I mean, who knows with him? Like the talent is there, but as even when he signed, like it's a high maintenance body. Yeah. Like it's, he's a I want to see what he looks like when he comes back. He was already, it was already a really soft body when he signed, like you never know what's going to happen with that. And he says, you know, there aren't many 17 year, 18 year olds who sign at six, six two thirty, Right. So he's, and as the emailer said, uh, Ethan said, he's had injury issues his entire career. So at this point it's just, I mean, we're throwing darts to, it's hard to say, we don't know what, where he is in his rehab. I mean, I haven't seen him on a mound since 20, uh, last year, maybe spring training last year. Yeah. So it's like, who knows? I, I mean, mean, it's say he misses this entire season, right? And maybe he pitches an instructs. But that means in 2016, he'll have thrown... He'll throw like 60 career innings. Or yeah, no more. Yeah, no. I mean, in 2017, oh, no, like he, 60, yeah. 2017, he threw 55 innings. 2016, as a pro, he threw another six, but in high school, he threw like 39 or whatever. So, yeah. like, he's still under 100 pro innings. Yeah. And he'll be, in, he'll be 21 years old, having been drafted in 2016. Year. His fifth year. Yeah. I mean, he's Rule 5 eligible in... 2020 at the end yeah. of next year yeah no i mean it's it's not ideal <laughs> next year they're gonna have to put him in greenville to start the year he's gonna have to get to salem and yeah. they're gonna have to make a call because he could get popped in rule five based on the upside no, they would they would add him they, they, they added denny Reyes. no that's that's what i'm saying oh, is they yeah, would yeah, need yeah. to add him because if you can't and meanwhile it's like you've got a guy who you're hoping is gonna make portland on your 40-man roster you know it's just it's not a good situation to be in. It doesn't mean nothing will happen. It doesn't like it doesn't mean it can't happen, but it's just it's not ideal for his yeah, projection, development. for yep. his development. Yeah. So thank you for the emails, everybody. Again, it's podcast at soxprospects.com if you want to hit us up. We want to talk about what you want to hear about. So make sure you drop us a line. Anything st- draft related, player related, you know, process related, player development related, scouting related. We want to hear it. So, uh, again, podcast at SoxProspects.com. Ian, should we send it home? All right. Well, we want to thank you all for listening. We want to thank you, send a thank you to our podcast editor, Joe Tetrault, Podcast Joe 2.0. You can follow Ian at Ian Cundall. That's I-A-N-C-U-N-D-A-L-L on Twitter. You can follow me at SP Chris Hatfield on Twitter. And you can follow the site's account at Sox Prospects. Make sure you do so. Follow us on Facebook, too. We're on Facebook. Just search for Sox Prospects. We're on there. Um, we uh, we got links to the stuff that we put up on the news page. Follow us there. Uh, and, of course, follow the site. Again, the donation drive, SoxProspects.com slash donate or Patreon.com slash SoxProspects. If you want to support the website, if you like what we're doing, uh, we would appreciate um, you helping us out with a contribution. We don't have any, you know, NPR-style tote bags, but you at least get some great baseball content. So we'll give you that. Um, for Ian, I'm Chris. Thank you for listening, everybody. We'll be back in your eardrums soon.